and then you can help your husband support the family. If you marry a no good, no, no good husband, then you leave your husband and you know, be on your own and you will not be dependent on anybody. I thought my father was very, um, what do you call this, was very advanced for his time. This was in the 50s. So you, you can imagine a man saying that way. But I, all to him and to my mother, I owe whatever I have now, also in terms of leadership, because they really showed me and gave me the confidence that I can be whatever and whoever I want. Uh, there's so many things, but I will not bore anybody uh, anymore about my history. So, Well, it's actually quite interesting what you say about your father being ahead of his time. And I think that um, there's some of us who've been fortunate to have that kind of support. Mm -hmm. Maha, we're in an unprecedented time right now in global history, um, in our lifetime, actually. And what are you observing when you, when you see women leaders stepping up to the plate? How are they showing leadership? What kinds of examples are you seeing? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, the news every day is so depressing. But what heartens me is the emergence of real leadership at this time. And I think you and I know that it is in times of crisis that real leadership uh, comes out. And you will also see the failed leadership. And I think you can see that in many countries. But I can think of some women, and I was just, you know, every day because of the lockout, you just read and you, you know, you, you watch the television. I could identify a few leaders who, women leaders, who I am really so impressed. And while I will not go very far yet, I will just talk about, first of all, my own governor in this small state of Rhode Island. She's a woman, but she has the tenacity and she is really very strong. And, you know, we're a small, a small state, but she was able to, with, with her decisive, inclusive decision making, she is able to contain the pandemic in, in, uh, in the state. Uh, so we're very happy and she's very clear in her communication, <clears throat> communicating to the people of Rhode Island that we are in for a hard time, but she expects all of us to really uh, cooperate so that we can save the people of Rhode Island. But other, other women that I could think of is the president of Taiwan. It's hard for me to pronounce her name, Chai Ing Wen. Um, she learned from her previous experience from SARS. And because she's very near, they're very near China, but they were able to contain the pandemic because of the protocols that they have established following um, SARS. So she also have used the people around her and the infrastructure that they have to be able to contain the pandemic. There's also Jacinda Arden, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand. Actually, now Jacinda is handling to, um, well, she handled the first crisis that she handled was the massacre in Christchurch. And again, very decisive woman. She immediately banned all the, you know, the assault weapons uh, that's coming in the country. And while in some countries like my country, the U.S., that would not really happen, you know. Uh, but she immediately, uh, what do you call this, immediately stopped the selling and the buying of the assault weapon. And now even with the, with the pandemic, the coronavirus, she's very decisive in, in making sure that there will be no social, social gatherings. She also warned deportation of anyone who, would be, who, who may be in New Zealand and not following... Uh, <clears throat> not following the rules. The other people I can think of, and you know, I went through the list of all the women. We have a number of uh, women leaders across the world, but the other ones related to pandem pandemic that um, that I can think of is Angela Merkel. You know, I think Angela Merkel of Germany has has really um, showed her leadership in so many years in so many situations. And the other one that I could think of is, um, yeah, I think I've mentioned already the Taiwan, the Prime Minister of uh, New Zealand, Angela Merkel, and of course my own governor here in Rhode Island. Right, so. and, and for those of you that um, I didn't maybe make it clear that um, 
that Maha is now currently living in Rhode Island in the US um, um, and is originally from the Philippines. So just to make sure that everybody understands that. Um, Gord, I'll ask you to flip to the next slide. Um, you were mentioning, Maha, um, a number of, uh, of great examples of women. I, I can think of also here in Canada, mm -hmm. there's a lot of conversation right now um, around um, some of the strong women that seem to be running things mm -hmm. for in Canada at the moment um, with respect to the response to the medical or to the pandemic, um, including Dr. Teresa Tam, who is the chief medical officer. Um, so she and some of the um, other federal government um, uh, representatives, including the deputy prime minister, who's also a woman, um, and others are, are really stepping to the plate. And I, I think that what we see um, are um, for the maybe not for the first time in every aspect, but we're seeing women at the forefront in a, in a much stronger way than we did before. But those are known names, and those are what we are hearing about that are um, uh, you know women that are visible. Um, but then there's also all the un you know the invisible women as well, mm -hmm. if, if you mm -hmm. will. Uh, um, I'm just thinking about the percentages, which vary from one country to the next of healthcare workers and mm -hmm. you know the number of healthcare workers who are female and i would i would um i would predict that um I, the vast majority of women uh, of people in the nursing field for example are women and so they're at the front lines all the time and then there's a whole range of other essential workers that i think that uh, we see um, a huge percentage um being applied to women so there's a number of women also in that mix um that are that you know it doesn't mean that they're in the most formal position but they're also playing absolutely critical roles right now um when you see some of these examples um what are you think what do you see as being the qualities that are exemplified by by women that uh, that help them take those leadership roles to the next level in these kinds of moments mm -hmm. by the way my daughter is a nurse so she is right there in the front exactly. line as well you know so and with her and as you have said the former leaders and even these health workers um, one thing that i can always think of is uh, as a quality is courage and i think everybody knows what can, uh, what courage is it's the quality of mind and the spirit that enables any one of us to face difficulty and danger without fear but connected with the, from my perspective and i see these women connected with <clears throat> with courage is uh leading with principles uh, these women are leading with ethics <clears throat> i'm sorry <clears throat> no problem Take your um, time. so leading with uh with principles leading with ethics they are courageous because they know there is a higher purpose uh you know like in this case saving lives and i know sad to say there are many health workers who already have died doctors and and nurses who who are right there in front because they need to save the lives of these people so one of the qualities that i see is really courage the other one is the confidence that they have that they have something that they know that they can deliver mm -hmm. but together with that confidence is the sense of humility that they cannot do everything and that they need partners they need the others who have skills that they may not have uh, to help them um, and so good leaders for me uh, women or men surround themselves with competent uh, competent team members the other one which uh, and this is something that struck me from the president of taiwan is learning from past experience utilizing the lessons from there so that not you know the same mistake will not happen again so as i've mentioned a while ago the president of uh, taiwan learned from their sars experience and what they did was to put in place certain protocols which they are now implementing in um what do you call this in um in in the case of the pandemic um and again for the most part again even the I, and I've heard this from the medical uh, people, the, the nurses and doctors, and now even the leaders, having or making decisive decisions, but also inclusive decisions, especially for the health workers, 
now they have to decide what they have to do if a patient is dying or not. Um, mm -hmm. So being decisive, I think, is a quality uh, that is necessary for a good leader. Um, otherwise, everybody will die, you know, if a leader is wishy-washy, should I do this or should I do that? Oh, but part of that, being decisive, I would think, is the ability to immediately look at what would be the risk if I do this one, if I do this action, what would be the risk? And if I don't do it, what would be the risk? So the whole risk uh, identification and mitigation is mm -hmm. really very important in, in the life of a leader. Right, and I've been following just a little bit here mm -hmm. some, of the, some of the chats. I can't quite go fast, but I do see that um, a couple of uh, comments have been that some of the unsung heroes right now in terms of leadership are the women who are at home. They're mm. stuck at home. And I think this, uh, this discussion about um, mm -hmm. your leadership in both the private space and the public space is something that we, we have to pay attention to here. Um, it isn't business as usual. Mm. And, and those private and public spaces, your work and your, and your home life are, are even more intertwined than they might have been before. I'm just thinking you mentioned, you know, decisiveness um, and, and, you know, being, uh, being very careful about uh, making decisions with certainty, um, some very strong examples of that. I've been thinking a lot, um, especially in the last few weeks about resilience and reading mm -hmm. back up over about resilience theory. Mm -hmm. and, you know, resilience tends to be one of those words that gets overused, but in this case, it's really about um, our ability to be to be able to, you know, sort of rise to the challenge or to bounce back um, from uh, from major crises, and I think that everybody deals um, with crises differently. But uh, one of the, um, I think, the hallmarks of good leadership is is your ability to adapt and to and to mm. to find ways of of strengthening and and improving on your resilience. Um, your ability to withstand the shocks, if you will, of, uh, of different uh, events that will occur. And then I'm also reading in, in some uh, articles, the um, again, and this will be of no surprise to anybody on this call, the importance around communication mm -hmm. and just how, it, how important it is to ensure that communication is clear, that it's being done with empathy. It's mm -hmm. also being done mm -hmm. with calmness. And when I see the kinds of, of public leadership examples that are out there, the reason why some of the women and men as well are, are so effective is their ability to also bring about a sense of calm mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and kindness and, um, and, uh, and just be able to, to help people navigate as they're moving forward. Um, in terms of your career, you've had to address um, several different kinds of crisis moment. And I'm, I'm just asking what were some of the learnings that you took away um, in your own work um, around your ability to manage crisis? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, in plan, I manage uh, several teams during earthquake, um, during the floodings in Thailand, for example, the tsunami in uh, Southeast Asia, we also, there was also a big, you know, very disastrous typhoons in the Philippines. And, and on top of that, you have some labor issues that you need to deal with as country director, uh, for example. So I had to draw up from some of my personal strengths and personal experience. Um, every one of the things that I've learned is every assignment gives me new lessons and I have to pick up from those lessons. Uh, as I've, I've mentioned about the president of Taiwan, you know, what did you do better or what did you do wrong last time that you, you should not be uh, repeating? So I think one of the, the strengths that I have or I've, things that I've learned is re really looking back and say, okay, what, what happened then and what can I apply in this current situation? I, I think I also mentioned that I, I think I have very high degree of self-awareness. So I know what I can do and I also know what I cannot do. And that helps me identify what are and who are the people I would need around me who will be able to help me make decisions. 
I guess some of the pitfalls of leaders, um, it, I'm sorry, I'm laughing because I'm thinking <laughs> of a person in my head, okay? That I can do everything, you know, I know everything, but that's not, that, that's not the case. Uh, in this pandemic, for example, you know, I, I'm not a medical person. Uh, I just have to trust people who, uh, the epidemi epidemiologists, I, I need to trust them to determine what would be the, the issue. Um, the other thing that I thought I did very well when I was leading the team in this particular, um, uh, what do you call these challenges, is the ability to listen. I really have to listen. You talk about communication, Eileen, about, uh, you know, with empathy, with... I remember when I went to the Philippines, we had 500 staff, and in the midst of the typhoon, the, in the midst of the disastrous typhoon, the Haiyan, we were, you know, dispensing how many, uh, more than $100 million uh, for the rehabilitation. But there were so many issues. So the first thing I had to do was to listen to everybody uh, at the same time that you are trying to look at the program. So uh, in maybe in three, three weeks, I went around the different areas in the Philippines and spoke with the 500 staff. And that is no joke. That is no exaggeration. But, uh, and that reminds me of what I call in the leadership nugget. You, you talk they will ask questions, but you do something, they will follow, you know? So as a leader, they have to see that you are equally there in the, in the front line. Um, mm -hmm. During the flooding in, in Thailand, you know, I also did, you know, I packed, I packed the goodies just like the staff. So I wasn't just directing and I was there with them in, um, what do you call this? In, in, in the field, right in front of whatever is happening. Um, and then, as I've said, you know, I use, I, I recognize the, the contributions of everybody and you, in, you include them. And that, make, that made my job a lot easier because you have partners in, in dealing with, uh, you know, with the crisis. Transparency for me is very important. So, and again, related to the communications that you were talking about, I'd rather that be honest with them. This is the situation. You lose your job because of this, or we will have to change everything, and therefore you cannot do this thing anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But you also say it without being and being authentic without. Um, without people feeling threatened, you know, by those kind of changes. I'm not so sure if I'm answering your question, uh, Eileen. No, you are. And I'm seeing that there's a number of interesting um, comments that are being made. Um, and Anthony, I'm going to just uh, allow you to jump in here for a moment to, to share anything that you think is, is coming up, knowing that we can't catch everything. But is there anything you want to uh, um, throw in here? Um, that you're seeing no, just um, uh, just to speak to some of the, uh, the the comments and the remarks and the questions that are coming from uh, from participants. Certainly, um, a lot of the discussion is focused on uh, the informal uh, leadership role um, of women mm -hmm. in the informal economy, but then also uh, in the household um, and issues around. Um, uh, at one level, the, the comment being that the nature of this crisis is somewhat unique. And in fact, the uh, the the asset-based, community-driven approach uh, uh, is uh, is quite uh, unique that people are seeing mm -hmm. countries uh, mm -hmm. uh, because of the nature of the pandemic. I mean, in terms of being mm -hmm. be at home, obliged looking after your neighbors, all those types. Mm -hmm. of things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but also uh, questions about you know, uh, um, isn't this always uh, you know suggest that it's not so different? This is kind of like what usually happens in humanitarian crises. Mm -hmm. It's the women who rise to the fore in these informal mm -hmm. networks and, uh, and provision of, of care as being central to their historic roles and so on. So some suggestion that it's different and some suggestion that it's, uh, it's more of the same. That's right. And I would say that yeah, obviously the circumstance is different, but we do, we have historically seen women doing this, always rising to the challenge and often doing so 
um, at great personal risk and also with very limited resources. So, um, so excellent points that are being that are coming up. And um, Gord, if you can switch to the next slide, but I do want to um, just uh, emphasize one thing that I'm hearing about um, women at home, and it's something that is occurring to me, and I think is worth studying in our own respective contexts. Is is what is happening with the care economy? What is happening, um, especially among professional women who may have been working out of the home most of the day, who all of, all of a sudden find themselves back in this situation of, of not only, uh, of being back in the home, um, of having expectations maybe shift around that, and in addition to that, trying to cover um, the, the kind of work that they were normally doing. Maha, what are you seeing? Do you, do you see that, do you, ha do you have some concern about that? I think it's worth looking at in terms of care economy shifting. Yeah. First of all, before I answer that, some a thought came to my mind why women uh, naturally uh, comes out, you know, during crisis or disaster. I may not be fair with Gord and uh, Anthony, but women are so used, Gord and Anthony, no, no offense, but women are used to taking care of people, taking care of kids, taking care of the home. So there is that innate, you know, it's a very natural thing for women to stand up, you know, and stand out in times of crisis. I saw that in my mother too, you know, um, that mm -hmm. the, the care, women are supposed to care. And that's exactly, I mean, leading to what you are saying, because women care, we sometimes forget our, our own self-care, you know, mm -hmm. um, and this pandemic, and somebody mentioned that this is normally, it's not really different, but in crisis, it's the same. Um, any change changes our, uh, what do you call this, our habits or change our routine. So the pandemic right now um, have actually disrupted everything that we are doing. Um, you know, we dress up in the morning for those of us who take care of the kids, give them breakfast, you know, and then send them to school. Uh, but now there's no school to send uh, the kids, so they're at home. Um, you know, our time to, well, women, we have time to go to the parlor, for example, or have a massage. I was just telling Eileen today I'm supposed to have my massage. But because of the <laughs> pandemic, no massage today. You know, we have, <laughs> we just, we have this uh, uh, webinar. So everything, uh, you know, everything has been disrupted. So the, the, for the women now, our professional and uh, domestic life now have, you know, merged into, and we cannot distinguish anymore, maybe, you know. Uh, the lockdown also, I read something that, the lockdown has created this uh, pressure cooker situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not so sure if we will be talking about domestic violence, Eileen, but um, that's a, because of this uh, pressure cooker uh, situation, the domestic violence occurrence seem to be more common. Uh, and maybe we have not heard enough. But I did read in Pennsylvania, for example, in one of the, one of the small uh, areas where there is a lock, lockdown situation or lockdown rule, the man lost his job and, you know, the, the stress of losing a job plus cannot do anything led him to get his gun. By the way, there's an increase in gun sale here in the States also. So there, he got his gun and killed his girlfriend before he killed himself so this pressure cooker uh situation is really uh adding to the stresses uh, especially for the woman who who need to care for everybody again it's just a very mm -hmm. natural tendency of women uh to care yeah well we've been going into the topic now and uh, around gendered implications on our mm -hmm. you know on our roles and responsibilities in mm -hmm. um, in moments of crisis and i think um, these are uh these are things that we need to be paying attention to these these emergent changes and of mm -hmm. course the biggest um the, the scariest one in my view is uh 
is the um, the uh, the potential for the increase of gender-based violence or mm -hmm. child abuse as well. Mm -hmm. But in, you know those two areas in particular, yeah. um, and you know I don't want to dwell too much on the negative part of it. We we know the risks that are there, but I've been trying. I've been grappling with what are the ways in which we 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 try to address this given the constraints that we now have of needing to stay home, of physical distancing from one another. And I just read this morning an example of the way in which um, one of the Northern Territories of Canada, the Yukon Territory, is looking at addressing um, women who are in vulnerable situations at home. And that is, they're giving out free cell phones to those women that are in those spaces yeah. of vulnerability. That in and of itself okay. is not a, a you know not going to change everything, but it's another way in mm -hmm. which they can somehow have contact. So to me, that was an innovative approach yeah. Yeah. Uh, of thinking about it. Another is the in the site we're seeing with the federal government as well as I think the provincial governments as well. Um, mm -hmm. This increased financial support and uh, and resources going to to women's shelters. Mm. Now, of mm. course, that varies around the world, um, you know, the extent to which those, those, um, those resources exist. Um, so much of what we know about domestic violence in so many countries is that it's, it's very much in the, in, in the privacy of the home. It's not talked about. Mm -hmm. um, so what will be really interesting to know is, um, um, if, you know, if participants could be sharing with us, yes. what are some of those initiatives that mm -hmm. they're seeing happening in your own countries that are ensuring um, that the, some of this is being addressed or what other women-led initiatives might be uh, undertaken right now to keep the push forward around equity and around mm -hmm. inclusion. Um, so those are some of the things. So, so thinking about um, what's happening around gender-based violence for sure. Um, absolutely essential. Um, this is life and death. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking about what's happening with informal workers, who the majority of are, are women right, in many places. When I think about um, the visit I just uh, made to India with colleagues in February, um, mm -hmm. we were working um, and we were connected to the Self-Employed Women's Association, which is you know comprised of millions of informal women workers uh, as their membership. You know, and they're really right now taking um, taking some unique uh, approaches to to try to support their their membership as they move forward. So, are there other things that you're seeing when we're thinking about gendered implications, Maha, that you you would like to bring out? And I encourage people yeah. to put in your chats as well. Yeah, you know, I was supposed to. I I was about to say too that maybe it would be interesting for mm -hmm. others. Because you and I can see Canada and the U.S. for the most part as to what's right. happening. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, what, especially with domestic violence. But there are also issues about, um, uh, what do you call this, the senior people. Um, the elders? The elders. Uh, there was, I think I mentioned to you the other day that, you know, there are some people who said here that it's okay for for older people to sacrifice their lives so that, you know, um, so that we can save the economy of America. So that, that's, I think we really need to look at what, what is this pandemic doing to the children? You mentioned about child protection, to the women, um, to, the, to the elders, to the LGBTQ communities, for example. Um, and also, again, I'm not so sure if that's uh, happening in, in the U.S., uh, in Canada. You know, the whole uh, discrimination against Chinese here because it's supposed to be a Chinese, mm -hmm. uh, Chinese virus. Um, so th there are a lot of gender-based violence, gender-based discrimination that I think we really need to look at in this case. And it, it need not be this pandemic. A leader needs to really look at whether it's a flooding or typhoon or, you know, what do these crises do to, uh, you know, most vulnerable, for example, the mm -hmm. marginalized. Um, you talk about the workers in India. We have lots of workers in, um, and they group together. They cannot group together. We have how many, I think right now we have about 10 million who have signed up for, um, 
unemployment, you know, because they cannot be working in, um, in groups, so they have to be furloughed. So th these are some of the issues. The only, the only country I am following up right now because it's nearest to me is uh, the Philippines, for example, uh, because I get messages from the Philippines. You have women workers, you particularly mentioned about the women workers and the poor of the country uh, who cannot follow uh, distancing, social distancing, uh, who cannot follow lockdown because they need food, they need work. Um, and, you know, what, what do you do with these people? I, I, I don't have the answer, you know, and it's just interesting, as you have said, maybe the others will be able to write down what, what are some mm -hmm. of the strategies of the government in, uh, in dealing with especially those who are marginalized in this pandemic. So. Well, that's right. And I think um, it was mentioned before that um, that this is a moment where um, actually the, the best of what we call ABCD, asset-based community-driven approaches, can really be applied. But the, uh, the way that that, mu that that must be effective is when we are applying the intersectional approach. You mm -hmm. alluded to that, I think, Maha. We didn't call it that, but that's really um, at the end of the day. Um, what we need to be ensuring is that we are um, not including historically underrepresented or marginalized groups, that we're not excluding them from any of the, the interventions that we need to be making in, in a moment like this, um, mm -hmm. whether they are the LGBTQ community, whether they are persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that no matter what country you're in, that they're particularly vulnerable right now, especially when we're in a mm -hmm. lockdown mode. Um, um, so, you know, finding ways of, of really bringing out the best in what, what it means to be community. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, if, if nothing else um, good comes out of a, a moment like this, what mm -hmm. I do think is coming out is a, a stronger sense of community. Um, where it gets more challenging is where you have uh, geopolitics or whether you, where you have conflict also immersed in, mm -hmm. in what's happening. And, and so for me, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's especially interesting to, um, and a bit concerning to see how that intersects at this moment. And, you know, countries and communities will have an opportunity of you know, going either one way or the other in terms of, you know, a positive social change that is longstanding, mm -hmm. that, that brings out the best in community, or, or something else which is a little scarier. And, you know, the talk about the, the, the rise in numbers of guns purchased makes mm -hmm. me, you know, makes me yeah. worried about that. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, uh, so applying an intersectional approach here, thinking carefully about, um, you know, the ways in which um, different interventions are being made. Um, I want to flip over to uh, Gord and Anthony to see if there's any, any feedback that they'd like to share from the comments and uh, that we've been receiving online. Uh, sure, there's been a lot of discussion parallel to what you've been uh, talking about, um, uh, and I suppose I see uh, three different levels of um, reflections, one of which is women in the household and how do they deal mm -hmm. with the, the burdens of labor and, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that within the, uh, in the house and, and the, uh, the implicit threat of uh, violence. Uh, secondly, there's the question of how in communities are women supporting each other or through different community groups and one of the points being that this really exposes women to risk because um, uh, of the care nature of a lot of the work that's being done at the moment and the impossibility of doing that in many communities mm -hmm. uh, the lens of uh, social distancing or, or anything like that, that that's really problematic and puts women at risk. And the third one that's come up by a couple of people is um, around the question of advocacy. Uh, basically, mm -hmm. are not able to do advocacy work at this time, either to influence government policies. Um, a particular case was mentioned around uh, vulnerability of, of mental health or gender-based violence, mm -hmm. types of things, or more uh, broadly in terms of the economic policies that the government's putting. Mm -hmm. How do we try to ensure that a women-centered, if not a feminist, lens is applied to those policies? So. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, thank you, thing. Anthony. Those are great. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in in many of our classes at Cody, and in particular the women's leadership classes, 
we do use a framework that was de designed by Gender at Work, um, and it's also been uh, made fairly popular by AWID, the Association of Women's Rights and Development. And it's a domains of change framework in which we, uh, we try to address um, the spaces in which we are, uh, we are wanting, to see, wanting to see change to occur, especially when it comes to looking at questions around equity and justice. And th those spaces could be, uh, are, are, um, are including laws and policies in, on the one hand, um, and also uh, access to services and service delivery and resources. Those are both sort of on the formal side. Mm -hmm. On the informal side, where we are trying to create change is around cultural norms and practices, as well as looking at individual um, values and worldviews and ways of, of, of knowing and doing. And so those four areas are a useful way of, of looking at how we, 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 uh, we address change. But when we're looking at a, a particular context, like the one that we are in right now, we can overlay it with, the, with a discussion about how the pandemic, how these health considerations or how these, um, these, uh, you know, these socioeconomic considerations in the pandemic moment are also affecting the way we do our advocacy work for those changes. Maha, what do you, uh, what, what are your thoughts in terms of the ways in which we, we sort of step up to, um, to look um, very critically, especially in our organizations and how we adjust to those kinds of changes, if you will? You, first of all, you mentioned about advocacy. Right now I'm thinking, you know, how can we really do advocacy at this time, you know, when we do not, you know, like we have to attend to the, the dying. Um, it's really abnormal, you know. I'm, you, but you gave me some kind of challenge at this point. And I, I have to think about that, you know, what, what do we do when it comes to advocacy or somebody wrote that. Um, mm -hmm. But to your question about, uh, you know, should I, can you rephrase the question again about you know what do we do with the plans that we have or well we sorry. may have in our organizations in yes, particular right. we may have a whole range of different programs of it. different advocacy yeah. campaigns yeah. so it, it seems to me right now rather than saying no we can't do any of that yeah there's going to be some of that right because yes, we're going back course. to the basics what do yes. people need to survive yes. Exactly. But, but there's also ways in which we can be ensuring that we're, we're, we're continuing to focus in on questions around inclusion, around sure, rights exactly. and justice, but okay. viewing now that with, the, with also the lens, if you will, of the pandemic in our mind. So what might you suggest um, for some actions that could yeah. happen that way? Uh, first of all, I think, um, you know, any program or any plan, and we're talking about now, you know, the humanitarian or any civil society organization or NGOs, any program that we put in place have to, I think I mentioned it a while ago, have to make sure that we identify risks. And this emergence of pandemics like this or emergence of typhoon or natural disasters are always to be included as risks and therefore we should have some means to mitigate that. Um, in this situation, I can just think of an example. I do not know if, if Samya is, uh, is participating right now. Samya is one of the CODI graduates. Mm -hmm. And we were talking the other day about um, the, you know, the work that they have on gender, uh, gender equality. And they, the program calls for you know, uh, going to the community and organizing women to talk about um, to talk about equality, to talk about gender uh, violence and things like that, but now because of the social distancing, we cannot. They cannot do that. So we had to think of ways, you know. Uh, so we said, do we really drop the whole um, gender, you know, the gender program, so that we can attend to coronavirus? And we said, well, maybe you don't need to drop the whole concept of the program but it's just the way you know the means by which you can reach the women and so we were talking about social media and now not all the women have especially older women or adults 
may not have the uh, what do you call this the access to social media but then Samia mentioned that they have lots of young people with phone you know with social uh, and have access to social media so we were talking about how about tapping these young people with the same curriculum that you have in you know the training of women on equality but they become now your your uh, what do you call this your volunteer group using social media so in other words uh, you know there should be plans and we can always you mentioned about resilience eileen mm -hmm. people we are resilient we are adaptable you know and we can always um we can always talk about if this is not possible what is possible <coughs> i'm sorry again bless you um i always tell um my staff during those times i will never accept an answer we cannot do it because there will always be ways of doing things just being creative and right now this pandemic i'm seeing a lot of you know, a lot of creativity among people young people and adults so but if that doesn't work if that still you cannot find creativity uh, cannot find another option i always say we will drop the old plan you know drop it because there is another need so develop a different uh, a different program to meet the needs of um, of people you talk about equity uh, needs of those who do not have uh, who do not have food so the traditional or the regular program of of, um, of an organization may need to be dropped and we've done that before you know i've done mm -hmm. that in thailand for example we have to drop the traditional or the the plan program in the philippines we have to drop the the old program because we have now to to make sure that the children in the flooded situation in the typhoon situation are taken care of we need to make sure that the people have food so mm -hmm. anyway what i'm saying is we can be creative look at the plan and see other options the other thing is if there is no other option is to replan plan a different program to meet the needs of of the population or of the marginalized group that we are addressing so mm -hmm. again am i answering your question i mean i'm sorry well you are and of course all of our wonderful participants are also sharing some really good insights and mm -hmm. at, you know at this stage i am hoping that um you are sharing all of you some of the ways that your organizations are now adapting to the new circumstances. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, let's not, uh, you know, it, it isn't business as usual. We are having to make hard choices about what goes forward and what doesn't, but it's also, it's also a chance and an opportunity to really test, you know, what is our reason for being? What's our raison d'etre as an mm -hmm. organization? Mm -hmm. Are we really reaching, if we are a service delivery organization, are we really reaching those that are most vulnerable? There's no greater test than the moment that we're in right now to decide and to determine whether we are on the right track. And I think, again, a silver lining moment from, from this crisis moment is, um, you know, health and well being aside, which I'm hoping for everyone, that we have an opportunity to retool and to mm -hmm. rethink and to ensure exactly. that we're course correcting <laughs> if necessary. Um, and, you know, and, and particularly there, there's an opportunity for organizations, even if it doesn't look like it's the most critical thing on their list, depending on who, you know, what the organization is, of where they're ensuring that all voices are being brought to the table, that diversity okay. is present, so that the innovations really can happen. Uh, and that includes, of course, ensuring that women are in those spaces of leadership as well. I want to shift to a, a kind of a closing comment now for us, mm -hmm. and then we'll we'll take a look at what some of the feedback has been. Um, and that really is about um, what I'm calling a reclaiming of the idea of self-care. So in the last couple of years, particularly in the in the in the women's leadership work and, and gender equality work, we have really been speaking quite a lot about you know, the importance of self-care, of recognizing that we all don't have to be heroes all the time, that we need to be taking care of ourselves. But now with this, with the, with the COVID-19, um, not, you know, and that's, COVID-19 is one thing, but there's also 
many other things we talked about, like natural disasters, um, you know, obviously, you know, major family issues. There's, a, there's even greater seriousness at this moment to really thinking about self-care. So, I mean, what, how do you feel about that? What do we need to do now um, to ensure self-care? And here I'm not, you know, not talking about going to just get a massage or, or the bubble bath, as wonderful mm. as those things are, but really in terms of taking care of ourselves. But also, you know, given that you and I are sitting in, you know, relative places of privilege, mm -hmm. um, you know, w what can self-care actually mean for women in low-income countries or mm -hmm. for the informal worker? What, what, are, what are some of the things that can be done? You know, I'm amazed. Even, you know, I've, I've seen the, in, in our work in plan, we work with the poorest of the poor and we work in different cultures. One of the things that inspire me really in my work is seeing women, seeing actually the community, as you've mentioned, to be, to be resilient and to be, actually they have their own way of dealing with situation. I think the, the women in other cultures, again, the, the participants may, may want to correct me uh, with that one, but my impression is sometimes they are better in dealing with hard situations than some of us, you know. Um, I remember somebody mentioned to me that uh, I will never know what it means to become, you know, an orphan or to be a poor woman because as you have said, you know, fortunately, I, was, I, I wasn't brought up in that situation. So I will never know. I may understand, but I will never know exactly how it feels. But they have a better way of dealing um, and I look at the stories, again, my story is the Philippines. I look at the women in the Philippines who have access to social media, and I'm just so impressed with how they are uh, coping. You know, and, and uh, in the Philippines, there's a lot of jokes going around, but that's their way of coping with, with the situation in terms of uh, self-care. I mean, if I will include that in the self-care. But anyway, uh, I was reading the other day uh, an article that, for, this is for the working women, uh, that says, the article said that do not try to be an overachiever at this time. You know, yes, you are working from home, but things are different. You know, the performance appraisal will not be the same as, you know, as we use performance review will not be the same. And that means you just take on what you need to take on. Uh, if that doesn't mean that the work will not be done, but do not overachieve. This is not the time to overachieve. But then look back to what you need as a woman um, right now. How much sleep do you need? Uh, what kind of things that will keep your sanity? Go back to your center. Um, you know, really find your center again and understand that there are things that are beyond our control and you know and even for myself uh, i'm not a full-time you know i'm not working full-time but you know i still feel depressed sometimes and i just tell my husband okay we need to you know we need to take care of ourselves first of all let's obey what they are saying you know the rules and regulations that they have put out there but also we have to find ways to make ourselves um, useful uh, where I can still think we are contributing to something, you know, like uh, there's a drive, food drive here for the people who do not have much food at this time. So we, we try to give something to, you know, to the food drive. So trying to find ways by which you can still you can feel healthy, you, you, you can take care of yourself, but at the same time, fulfilling what you think is the purpose. You, you mentioned about what are we here for, you know, not only the organization, but as individuals. What are we here for? What can we do? Um, I wanted to give blood, but I have very bad allergies. So my husband <laughs> said they will not accept your blood, honey. You know, so things like that. Um, Find your center, do not overachieve, um, and maybe this is a good time actually to, to do things that we have not done before because we are busy doing some other things. Mm -hmm. oh, those are all excellent points, Mahan. 
you know, I want to recognize that as we, as I mentioned earlier, and you, you reiterated, you know, we are privileged and we don't, um, we are not experiencing the same level of hardship as many women and men are facing, mm -hmm. children are facing around the world. You know, at the same time, I want to be cautious to say that we, again, everyone is addressing and dealing with this moment in a different mm -hmm. way. Different, um, yeah. it's, un it's unprecedented for everyone. So, um, so you know, it's, it's, it's fine to be feeling the way you're feeling. I, I've been reading a number of articles online that said, you know, this is, this is a moment where it's actually uh, 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 an emotion of grief that many of us are mm -hmm. feeling, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, because we've lost somebody or because of, you know, the, what we consider to be the normalcy of the moment has gone away. And, um, and there's, there's good things and there's bad things with that normalcy having dissipated, but being careful to, to be gentle on yourselves and, you know, to think about the overachieving, that's one thing that all of us mm -hmm. need to, especially women need to be thinking. Mm -hmm. through, but, um, but it's also allowing other women and men to shine. Um, you know, those that are on the front lines, mm -hmm. um, they, they're doing so, it's their profession, it's their will to, to support. So everything that we can do to support other women is, is absolutely um, critical. And it could be the smallest thing, or just the fact that many of us are just staying home. Mm -hmm. That is also acts of, of, of giving. So those are, those are all very important. I do want to reflect on um, on the uh, on the many teachings that I've received now from the wonderful indigenous women across this country, mm. across Canada, and a, a deed of around the world actually, um, who have always been um, located well on the land and thinking about what uh, what this earth requires and our 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 need to support the earth and to um, to to you know stop many harmful practices and sometimes. Um, as I'm thinking through this moment we're in, I'm also reflecting on the replenishing of the earth, if you will, um, yeah. as, a, as a balance um, to some degree of what we're going through. Um, I also am cautious, and you mentioned about um, media or social media. We're all using it. Um, there's very few people now that don't have some access to, to at least a cell phone or to some sort of mm -hmm. social media. And we need to be mindful of the amount of misinformation or yes. disinformation that's out there. Exactly. Um, and be very, very careful um, with our, you know, with what we might, you know, see as being um, information that uh, that actually mm -hmm. has political motivation behind Correct. it. Correct. Correct. So yes. the so you know as uh, as as uh, characterized by your your the president of the United States, this idea of fake news. Actually, the the idea of much of the, of the propaganda that is going around, including um, that is leading to you know aspects of discrimination, um, yes. we need to be very we need to be on alert and and stick to facts as much as we can. Exactly. Yes. Right. So, Maha, thank you so much. I'm going to turn to right now to to Gord and to Anthony to see what kinds of inputs we've been getting online. And I will say to all of you that are online today that have joined us, um, as well as those that had trouble getting in and out, we are recording this. Um, I think I started the recording slightly late, but it's still all there. And we will also be taking, um, taking the notes that you've been sending and compiling them in a document to be sharing with everybody so that you have that as a record. Um, but Gord and Anthony, anything that's is sort of jumping out that you'd like to reflect on? that you're seeing in the chats? I mean, it's been uh, quite uh, overwhelming, to be honest, in terms of the levels of input uh, from people. Um, so very uh, impressive in terms of level of uh, um, engagement. I mean, uh, I suppose, I mean, there, there are a couple of different sets of uh, comments or questions, if I could try to classify or generalize. Some of them were very um, uh, specific, uh, speaking to very specific needs or populations or situations. So. How do you deal with this in uh, um, uh, in informal settlements or in, in slum communities? Um, uh, how do you deal with uh, with this pandemic response in the situation of conflict. The example of Yemen was given yeah. Uh, yeah. issues around Cameroons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, questions about uh, how do you uh, you know why is it always up to women? How do we work with men on these issues? Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, and then I, I suppose the key thing that came through to me was then there was a whole bunch of either uh, asking for examples or sharing examples in terms of what people are doing or what people are, aren't sure what to do. So a real uh, uh, thirst, if you will, for practical examples. And I think it's because the, the, the overarching tone, at least the way I read it, was that uh, in many situations, people are waiting for the other shoe to drop, if I can mm -hmm. use the mm -hmm. Uh, the mm -hmm. governments have moved. Yeah. People are under um, uh, under different types of rules, of lockdown or or, or uh, social distancing or or, or whatever. Uh, but the medical crisis hasn't really hit yet in a in a big way. But there is just this um, level of um, a fear and of concern um, that is uh, that pervades, given all these restrictions being put on life, and then the reality about how many of these restrictions are only really manageable for middle and upper class people and people in lower income communities and households right. really can't right. live this way. They don't have food, they don't have income. It's yeah. impossible and they're being put in an absolutely untenable situation and mm -hmm. so we respond to that. Um, so I think those are the, the that, that would be my broad brush summary of the types of uh, interest questions and needs that people are, uh, are speaking to. Um, that's fascinating. Add, yes, please go ahead, Gord. So, I mean, I agree with all of that. And the only thing I would add is that, um, well, at the beginning, and it had a lot to do with the nature of the questions you were posing, Eileen and Mama, mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of the, the examples people were sharing were about what women are doing um, in their communities and yeah, at the household level uh, yeah. and beyond. And then in the last little while, there's been a lot of sharing of what our organizations are doing. What, what, are, what are the kinds of innovations and exciting things that we have seen or are doing that we wanna mm -hmm. share and we wanna learn what others are doing. So there's been a fair bit of, as women leaders in our own right. Um, so, you know, I just think there's, there's those levels as well that are important to highlight. And I think uh, the, the recording will be very rich as Anthony pointed out, because mm -hmm. there'll be many of the, it's impossible and overwhelming to take it all in at once. But if you have time to digest uh, later and go through and click on some of the links or the following up on some of the suggestions people are, have, are making, it may be, may be very useful. That's fantastic. Maha, any, any kind of response to what you've just heard from Gord and Anthony? I, you know, I really agree with, I, I wish I could see all of those because mm -hmm. that, you know, that would be very rich for this conversation. And for the participants, Eileen and I were just thinking maybe we will just have 20 of you. So it would be very interactive because it will be a learning situation for all of us. Uh, but hopefully the recording will help everybody to see what the others are doing. Uh, but I am particularly touched by one of the observations. This pandemic is really uh, hitting, or the rules, for example, uh, are hitting those who are the most vulnerable, those who do not have jobs. I think I alluded to that a while ago. And That's that right. is true. And that is, um, that is really difficult. And I've seen that, as I've said, in some of the, the information that I'm getting from the Philippines. Um, you know, what do you do with people who have nothing? And oh, also the people who are living in slums. How can you have yeah. social distancing in, uh, you know, in communities where they are all, you know, just not even a meter apart from each other? So um, that's right. And, you know, it's, uh, as you're saying that, I'm also thinking, of course, of internally displaced persons, mm. um, refugees, um, those that, uh, that don't have the level of state support thinking of the Palestinians in Gaza, for example, right, I was yes. reading on the weekend about just how few resources they have to, to combat this at all. So, I mean, these, these are obviously, um, this is a sombering moment that we're in and, uh, and coming back to the basics here about taking care of each other, I think is absolutely mm -hmm. critical. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that. I want to thank everybody for the rich um, conversation that you're having um, with us. And uh, as Maha said, you know, this is um, the, the response to this webinar has been outstanding. Um, and it's not allowed us to do the kind of uh, conversation that we would normally do if we had been face to face. But what I do want to, um, to um, suggest to you, Gord, if you want to move to the next slide, please, um, the, uh, the second to last slide. 
um, two things. One is I will speak with our communications team and ask that maybe on our Facebook page, we create a space where you can also share um, some, some feedback and we can continue this conversation. I'll do the same thing for those of those women on the call that are that are um, that are graduates. Um, we have our closed group, um, and I'm going to put something there also where we can continue our conversation as well. I do commit to sharing with all of you the recording as well as a written document that summarizes the uh, the feedback, um, the input that we've received online. Um, I'd like to encourage you to think about sharing with us topics that you'd like to explore further. This was meant to be an opening conversation and it came and we did this with the uh, with the idea of talking about women's leadership in the first instance. But we would really like to know at Cody what other topics you'd like to explore further. Um, we have a whole range of fantastic organizational partners that we work with um, around the world. Um, I know that they have uh, particular areas that they'd like to delve into our graduates as well. And even if you've never come to Cody and you're joining us for the first time, we'd love to hear from you as well. What, what are some of the things that are occupying you? Any of the topics we covered today really do deserve a drilling down into something more comprehensive. So we'll have to see how we can balance all of that. So share your insights with us and your observations. I've also put up on the screen our board's put up on the screen, um, and our email, womenlead at stfx.ca. I encourage you to reach out to us there to share your stories of women's leadership in particular, of where you're seeing women, women's leadership really shine in terms of innovation in this moment, and share your other insights and observations. And if you want further information, I'd like to reiterate to you that if you want information about Cody's programming, please go to the to the web link that's at the bottom there, um, cody.sanefx.ca slash education. And you will find a, a whole range of information about what we offer um, as an institution. Um, what are we doing at Cody? Um, we are looking for ways to be as supportive as we can to you, all of our graduates and participants um, around the world as well as here in Canada. We've also been very active locally in our own community and are constantly looking at ways um, to support community members. And this often takes place very informally. It has nothing to do with our organization itself. It's just that we are all committed uh, members of our community. And so looking at ways that we can support knowing the assets that we have and what we can bring to the table. Um, so that is something that we believe in. It's about how we give back locally as well as support our education, our, 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 part, our participants through our education programs globally. Um, Maha, I want to thank you so much for the time you spent today. This, this conversation came up very, very quickly and organically as we were checking in with each other. Um, I'm, I'm delighted that you were able to take part in this today with me. I know um, I, you know, I put you on the spot and you just rose to the challenge immediately. <laughs> so thank you so much for that. I really, really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I mean, and I'm really grateful also. I'm equally grateful. And for all of you mm. that have joined, thank you again also for sticking it out. I know for many of you, you got cut in and out. Um, lines are not equal um, around this world. Gord, did you have anything, any last thoughts that you wanted to, to say? Um, Reminder that Gord is our executive director here at the Cody Institute. Well, I just want to thank you and Maja Eileen for taking the lead, stepping up and uh, organizing Cody's first convening uh, in the pandemic crisis. And mm -hmm. I just want to point out to everybody here that, and many of the last few comments coming in that have been thanking you as well, have been saying we need to do more of this, that um, Cody is looking, all of our all of our colleagues here at Cody are looking uh, at, at different types of convenings that we might try to organize around various themes. Some of them could be around various course cohorts, around country cohorts. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll be getting back to you and putting out um, but, but, but uh, putting out ideas and trying to organize these. But by all means, as Eileen has already said, please send your ideas to us uh, because they may, um, they may trigger something with our colleagues and, uh, and maybe we can, you know, do these together. 
uh, in various ways. So that's all I want to say. Eileen, thank you very much, Maja, uh, for taking yeah. the time and, and just, and just like, like women leaders everywhere, just jumping in and making it happen. <laughs> well, thank, thank you very you, much, Gary. Gord. Um, and a final note to all of you, uh, on you know, behalf of Gord and Anthony, um, Maha, myself, the entire Cody team, Please stay well. Um, we are yes. sending you our very, very best wishes. We hope that your families stay safe and well. We know that this is a very hard time for, for everyone. Um, and many of you have family members that might be already sick or that you're very worried about. Um, I'll just know that we're thinking about all of you. Please reach out anytime you want to talk. If you, if you need somebody to, to just share, um, share a, a conversation with, um, we're here. And, uh, and we will be looking forward to talking to you again in the very near future. So thank you very much, everyone. And this ends the webinar now. Thank you for joining us.